So when I looked at the YouTube analytics for this channel recently, I noticed a common theme from my viewers. Six out of their top 10 searches were some variation of how to make a board game. So I figured I'd put together a little video and talk through the process from start to finish and just go through how to get that idea out of your head and onto a table. Now I've been designing games for about 12 years and I've created around 100 games at this point that at least got to the playtesting stage. And most of those have ranged somewhere between absolute dumpster fire and meh, but quite a few have been commercially viable and I've got around 15 or so that are either already on the market or will be very soon. And so as I walk you through this process, please know that I've done this quite a few times, but let's get into it. Now, the first thing to talk about is the general idea. What is your idea that's going to be turned into a board game or a card game? Like maybe you just saw a really good movie or just read a really sensational book, or maybe you just found out about a really interesting real world, real life process. And you're like, Hmm, I bet there's a game in there somewhere. And if you're a game designer, you're probably having that idea all the time. It's like, Oh, I bet that could be a game. Oh, that could be a game. And you're going to have way more ideas than you could ever bring to life and get onto an actual table. And so you're really just trying to figure out out of all these ideas, ideas, which one do you really want to work on? Which one do you really want to focus on? And you also kind of have to understand, as my good friend Jamie Stegmaier says, your idea is brilliant. Your idea is worthless. You know, it's all about the execution. Everybody's got ideas. All game designers across the world have good ideas. And in their minds, they're probably really, really good. But then what's next? Like, how do you go to the next step with that idea. And the first thing I do is just a simple brain dump. I, I get a notebook. I really like to write things down in this stage more so than just typing it out on a, in a Word doc or something like that. I really like just the feeling of writing it down in a game design notebook that I can carry around in my pocket or my backpack or something like that. And I just get out every single possible idea about the idea, about the game that I that I can. How many players is it gonna be? How long do I want the playtime to be? What are the, the ideas for mechanisms and, and themes and different angles for that mechanism or for that theme? Is there gonna be certain components? Is it gonna have you know, meeples and cubes and basic stuff. Do I need custom miniatures? But I'm just like writing down every single possible thing I can come up with. And this is really cool too, if it's like a real world, real life thing, like you're, if you're gonna design a game about, you know, creating cars or, you know, going from uh, taking a resource out of the world and then turning it into some kind of widget or whatever it is, like you're just writing down ideas about how that could be laid out in game mechanics and like actual gameplay. Is, is it something you're gonna actually have to dive into and really focus on? Or is it something you can kind of abstract out? Whatever it is though, you're just writing down every single thing you can come up with about the game and how it's gonna play. And also realizing that a lot of this, maybe most of it, maybe all of it is going to change, especially once you get later on into the process of playtesting. We'll get, that, get to that in just a minute. Everything is subject to change. So if you have a, a pencil, maybe that's good or an erasable pen, because you're going to be scratching stuff out. You're going to be erasing things and making it different. But the idea about your idea is to get it all out. All, just get as much out as you possibly can, because you're probably going to forget if you don't get it out as soon as you can. And as I'm writing down notes and really trying to figure out what the game is going to be and flesh out all of my ideas, one of the things I really like to think about early on is what is the game's main driving force? What is the main focus going to be? And in my mind, it's one of four possibilities. And the first one is theme. Is it a thematic driven game? Are you really trying to evoke a certain theme, a certain setting or world that the player is just going to be able to run around in and do cool things? Or is it mechanism? driven? Do you have an idea for a really interesting mechanism, the way cards play or dice are, are placed on the board or something? You know, do you have a variation on a mechanism that's already been done before, but you want to do it differently, but you're going to really focus on that mechanism? Is it component based? This is a game maybe like Jenga, where it's very specific components that kind of turn the game into what it is. It really make it the most fun. Or is it experience based? Are you really just trying to create a certain vibe, a certain experience for the player to have? And you want to really lean into that. Now, more than likely your game is going to have a variation of all of these things in, in some way, but what's the main one that you're focusing on? Because that's really going to help you make certain decisions and going to give you some focus on your game design and what you're going to be working on next. And another thing that's really helpful to figure out as early as you possibly can is how do you win? What's the end goal? What's the end state, the end game trigger overall? Because until you have that, you don't exactly have a game. You need to know, players need to know what they're trying to accomplish. How do you win? And until they have that, it's just really, you're just doing things. You're just going through some processes, but, but why? And you don't necessarily have to have that idea early on, like first off, but you need to have that pretty soon because it's going to determine a lot of other design, design decisions that you're going to be 
making. And you, you want players to be incentivized to go towards that end goal, towards that end game state so that they win. And so the quicker you can figure that out and hopefully part of your initial idea, the better. And speaking of end goals, what is your end goal with this game? And that's something else just to be thinking about early on as you're writing down notes and you're coming up with different ways that the game plays and different components that you wanna have. What is your goal for the game? Do you wanna get it published? Or is this just a fun little hobby, a fun little side project, some you know fun little thing to, to occupy your mind? There's no wrong answer. I mean, whatever you want to do is, is totally fine. I've done both. I spent several years just designing games for fun. And it was really for no one other than me and maybe some friends, maybe me and my wife, maybe me and my cat, like whoever just to sit down and play the game, not trying to get it published, not trying to license it out you know, or make money off of it. It's just something fun to do. That's totally fine. But if you want the game to actually show up on a store shelf, if you want it to go to Kickstarter or GameFound to be crowdfunded, if you want it to be a commercially viable product, you're going to have to make different decisions. It's going to change certain things about your design process. So as you're coming up with ideas, you're coming up with all the different ways the game's going to be played and all that, what, what's your big idea personally for this game's end goal? Just for fun, store shelf, because that's going to be a very different process. All right, now you've got all these ideas swirling around. You've written down as much as you possibly can. Now it's time to get the game out of your head and onto a table in the form of a prototype. And my advice is make the ugliest prototype you possibly can. Just, just get it out there. Just get some note cards and some dice and some little cubes, some, some dust from around here, some little pieces of trash, some, some dirt, some anything, anything, just anything to get the game on an actual table because until then it's just an idea it's not actually a game yet until you actually can have something that you can play so the quicker you can do that the better get the prototype made i've talked to so many designers that have such good ideas really cool ideas but they can't get out of their notebooks they can't just make the time or take up you know use the energy whatever it is to actually make a prototype and it's a little bit overwhelming and it's also a little bit scary and i just want to be honest about that all of us in the game not necessarily all of us but a lot of us in the game design world there's a little bit of fear because in your head the idea is perfect it's the next best thing it's better than monopoly it's gonna sell more copies than monopoly it's gonna be something that changes the world but but probably not you know and and you don't really find that out until you get it onto a table and so if I don't get it onto a table then I don't have to deal with that I don't have to reconcile the fact that my wonderful idea is actually a hot mess and so that's okay it's okay to be a little bit weary weary about that to have a little bit of anxiety you know making your first prototype for your for your game and I just want to encourage you set the bar low just l lower the bar as far as you possibly can I mean put the bar on the floor so you don't have to jump you just you just step over it and that's what I'm talking about with just an ugly prototype just something get it out there and in, in, in any form that you can and then go from there Right? Your game is going to change drastically as you go into that first prototype. A lot of times, as you're making, like as you're literally building the prototype, as you're turning the note cards into useful cards for your game, you're going to realize different things about your game that aren't going to work. And you're going to be taking down new notes and changing things not long before playtesting, just in the prototyping stage. That's why it's so valuable just to go through the process, to do the work, and just actually get something on the table. And what I like to do is just work on one system at a time. One thing at a time. Don't sit down and try to prototype the entire three-hour experience of your game. Just prototype one tiny aspect. One thing I like to start off with is like the movement system or the combat system. Just that one thing. How is it going to work? And just prototype that and just make some cards and, and get some dice or whatever you need you know, going to make the system work. And then just do that. One, it's helpful from a research standpoint, from like a testing standpoint, because you're only working on one thing at a time, you can focus. But from a prototyping standpoint, again, it just gets it out as quickly as possible. So one thing at a time, one system at a time, and as you prototype one, you kind of mess around with it, and you prototype another, mess around with it, and then you'll start interlocking and kind of bringing the systems together to make the actual game, but one thing at a time. Now, when it comes to components, for your prototype there are the obvious choices of just taking out of boxes on your shelf do you have games that you don't care about or don't play anymore or take the dice take the cards take the boards take the box take whatever you need out of those published games and then convert it 
into your prototype. I'm a big fan of stickers. You can go to Walmart and get the eight and a half by 11 uh, blank label stickers and then cut those up and write on those with a Sharpie and you know paste it over or just stick it right on top of a board and just draw your new board onto there. Again, make it ugly, just make it functional, make it usable. Uh, you can also go on Amazon. They have really good deals on cubes and meeples and dice and anything you know generic that you need. Uh, when it comes to components of kind of the more like custom nature, the more gamery type components, the Game Crafter is a wonderful place to get that kind of stuff and print and play games. Another really awesome resource to get special things kind of, you know, get those things made. You can also get custom printed stuff when you get a little bit later on in your prototyping. If you want cards that are actual cards more than just like, you know, a poker card with a with a note card in front of it stuck inside of a clear penny sleeve or something like that, you can actually go to these companies and they'll print stuff and send it to you. Not the cheapest thing in the world, but it does look good and it does make you feel good. And it's kind of cool to show up to game night, to show up to a play test session and have a really nice prototype. But do that later. <laughs> Just again, make it ugly at first. But those are some excellent companies to work with. When it comes to graphics, I'm a big fan early on of just an erasable pen and just writing down as quickly as I can. Okay, this is an eight and this is a four and this is this icon and this is that icon. Again, you're just trying to do it ugly and as quickly as possible. But when you want to move up a little bit into kind of a nicer, still ugly, but a nicer prototype, canva.com is an incredible resource. It will be your best friend throughout the prototyping process and you can create graphics and you can get custom stuff and you can get photos and icons and all sorts of stuff put it into templates things like that print it off and then slide it into your card sleeves or you know cut into stickers and things like that for your boards for your dice for anything really that's canva.com but when it comes to this part of the process i want to caution you a little bit because it can be really easy to fall into the trap of trying to find the perfect graphics, the perfect image, the perfect whatever, and you'll just scroll through Google images over and over and over again and you'll waste hours. And it feels like you're doing something. It feels like you're progressing in some way, but you're not. You're not actually getting anything done. It's kind of like being in your car and you're stuck in the mud and you might have your foot on the, the gas, foot on the floor, and the tires are spinning at 100 miles an hour, but you're not going anywhere. And so it's way better to not worry about the perfect art, perfect illustration. I mean, it's a, it's a prototype. Uh, and, and just find what works. I'm a big fan of icons. I don't even worry about illustrations or art, anything like that, especially early on. I just get icons, gameicons.net and the Noun Project are my favorite places to go to get icons. And I just slap an icon on everything. If it's a card, if it's a board, whatever, throw an icon on there. It's good enough. It's good enough. And then go from there. All right. So now you have a prototype and so it's time to get into the most important, the absolute most important part of this entire process, and that's playtesting. Actually figuring out what works about the game and what doesn't. And it can be kind of scary. Again, it's it's a little bit anxiety creating when, when you make a prototype, because now you're finding out for sure that your game idea is nowhere near as good as you thought it was. But then you get into the playtesting and it's, uh, it can be, it can be rough. It can, it can, it can be really just soul sucking <laughs> sometimes uh, when you find out your your game is it's not the hot mess you thought it was it is it is the absolute dumpster fire uh, you never dreamed of and so that's what playtesting does but it's it's not just a dumpster fire it's a refining fire it is the way that the game really truly comes to life when all the bad gets burned away and it just kind of you, you get that pure goodness hopefully that elegant wonderful masterpiece of a game that it, it comes out in playtesting and the more playtesting you do and the better you are at playtesting the better the game is overall and so early on starting out you're probably just going to playtest by yourself and just figure out how the game works and you're going to play through you're kind of going to go through the motions of the game and on a turn okay this is what i do okay i draw five cards and then i can play these cards and then this happens and then that happens okay now it's the next player's turn and early on you're probably going to play all the turns if it's a four player game you'll play this player's hand and th their turn and then you'll play the next player and then the next player and the next player and that can be really challenging if it's a game about like hidden information <laughs> or something like that you just gotta have to pretend but this is a really good way to do it early on just to figure out does the game work? Is there something in here? Is, is there fun to be found? Is the mechanism playing the way that you want it to? Is the theme coming to life? Is the overall experience, that vibe that you're really going for? Does it feel like a, a kind of a creepy game? You want it to feel creepy? You want the player's experience to be creepy or exhilarating or action-packed or whatever? Is that coming through early on just for you, by yourself? Now, also, it can be kind of hard to know those things because you have 
all the information in your head. You know how the game is supposed to work. You're, you're kind of playing it out in, in a perfect world because you know all the rules. You're literally creating and changing the rules on the fly. And so it can be kind of hard sometimes to, to know for sure is the game fun to know for sure is the experience coming through and so that's when it's nice to have a good friend or or, or seven <laughs> to bring in to help you play test the game people that you can you know give them some snacks give them a meal uh, thank them later on in the rule book if the game ever does get published but just some people that you can bring in that you trust that care about you They'll tell you the truth as much as possible, as much as you can with somebody you care about and somebody you love. But people that you can bring in and go, okay, I'm going to try not to waste your time and, and we're going to shut this playtest down. You know, if anybody gets to a point where they're just bored beyond belief and that's something you really want to do early on, I've got a video all about playtesting and, and that's one of the main things is letting your playtesters know, hey, we don't have to finish the game. You know, this is supposed to be a 30 minute game and so if it gets into 45 minute territory, we're done. We're shutting that down. We're not going to be here for three hours because then they don't want to playtest anymore. They don't want to do that again. And so anyway, go through the playtesting process by yourself and then with some close friends, trusted people, some family members, maybe not your dog, maybe not your mom, depending, but just people that will tell you the truth to a certain extent. Then it's time to start playtesting outside of that. Maybe you can go to a game store or to a gaming convention and, and go to an unpub convention or something like that where you're sitting down with other people, people you don't know, people maybe you've never met before, never knew they existed, and now you're sitting down to play the game and now you're gonna get some really interesting data, some really good feedback as the game kind of gets out into the wild. And this is when the playtesting can get really, really good. As you're sitting there, you're taking notes, you're watching the players as they play, and that might even be better information. A lot of times you'll do like a feedback session after the game, but honestly, during the game, as you're watching people play it, a lot of times is the best information. It really, sometimes all the information that you need as you go through that. After that, you get into kind of the unguided playtesting territory where either you're in the room, but you're not saying anything. You give give playtesters the box and you say, hey, here, here's the rule book. You figure it out and you're watching them. Or maybe you teach the game, but then you step back either way. Maybe you're not in the room at all. Maybe you've shipped your game across the country to a, a brand new set of gamers and they're going to play it and then give you feedback later. Maybe they're going to film it and you get to kind of go in and like, a, like a football team and watch the film later. But that's kind of the late stages of, of playtesting typically after you know the game works it's kind of working the way moving the way that you want it to because again you don't want to waste a bunch of people's time uh, and also you might want to reciprocate if you're working with game designers you play test my game and give me feedback and i'll play test your game and give you some f feedback and we'll work together on this that's a really good way to do it you can also go online there's some really cool resources like tabletopia and tabletop simulator which are completely digital where you can sit down and play your game with people in totally different parts of the world. Now there's a pretty steep learning curve to those programs. You have to learn a good bit as far as like how to get your game onto those things. And there's, there's all sorts of really good videos on YouTube to teach you how to do that. But it is, is a wonderful, viable resource as far as playtesting goes. But all that to say, playtest. I mean, you just, just keep playtesting. When you think you've playtested enough, do 10 more right? You're never sure about what you're going to see. You're never sure how a player is going to sit down to this wonderful playtested game that you think is basically done. And then they come in with a weird strategy you've never seen anybody do before. And it completely breaks everything. And you're like, oh, how do I fix that? And so just over and over and over again, just keep playtesting. Your game will be better for it. You as a designer will be better for it. Then the next part of the process, and this is actually going on simultaneously in parallel as you're playtesting is iteration. You're, you're changing the game. Sometimes, especially early on, you're changing everything. I mean, so many times I've play tested a game for the first time and then wiped the, almost the entire slate clean. And so the, the next prototype, the second version is a totally different game. So going into the second play test, vastly different experience. And that's perfectly fine. One thing to always remember while play testing is that you're not just playing your game. That's different. Playtesting is like research. It's like scientific you know, data gathering where you're going into it with a hypothesis, with some ideas about what you're looking for, about what you're trying to test, what you're trying to figure out, saying things that you're trying to fix or whatever it is. And then you're iterating. You're figuring out, okay, well, that didn't work. Let me try this other thing. Okay, that didn't work. Let me try this other thing. Oh, that worked really well. Okay, but now this is broken over and over and over again. One thing to remember during the iteration process, this is actually my number one thing that I'm constantly trying to focus on, trying to look into is where's the fun? 
find the fun as much as you possibly can. Remember that a board game is a fun engine where players put time in and they get fun out. That's the idea overall of why they sat down to play the game. And so the more you're able to lean into that fun and just cut out pretty much everything else, the better your game will be. So find the fun as quickly as you can and then iterate over and over and over again through the playtesting, through the feedback gathering about where is that fun and how do I make that just the absolute focal point over and over as the game plays. Now, as you iterate more and more, as you get more playtests under your belt, you're, you're going to be changing fewer and fewer things. And eventually you kind of get to a point where you don't really want to change more than one thing at a time, because if, if you change too many things and then, well, some things are now fixed, and but now some things are, are now broken, well, which one caused which one? And you, you don't know. So it's kind of like, again, it's like science where you, you want to have a control and then you want to do one thing that's different and then compare the two, right? And so uh, you don't want to change too many things as you iterate more and more and more because it, it's going to make things harder uh, to figure out. And so just change one thing at a time. And then you're kind of, you're going to get to a point where you feel like, hey, I think I might be kind of done. And that's where uh, I just want to share with you one of my favorite quotes from a guy named Matt Leacock who designed Pandemic. And he said, yeah, when I'm 90% done, I realize I've got about 90% left to go. And he's one of the greatest designers in the world, one of the greatest designers of all time. So if that's if that's his take on it, then, then my thought is, okay, if, so if I get 90% of the way there, I've probably got like 342% <laughs> left to go, considering. Uh, so that's, that's just part of it. You're going to have a lot more to get done than you realize, even when you think you're almost finished. It's so hard to get a game across the finish line and just those last few tweaks, those last few iterations, it can be really challenging. So just know that going in, you're not alone. You're not the only one experiencing this. You're not the only one that's frustrated by the fact that you just can't find a way to fix that one little detail. It's all of us, it's everybody, so it's okay. But with that being said, finish the game. Find a way to get it across the finish line. And it can sometimes be a grind. It, it almost always is a grind at this point where you've done a, a zillion play tests, you've taken all this feedback in, you've heard some really tough criticism, you've changed everything 17 times. It's so hard to finish a game, but get it there. And finish is a weird word at the same time, right? Because you can never really be, you can get to a place where you're never really done, right? Where you can always tweak one more number, you can always change one more ratio, one more probability, you can always add or take away one more card. So don't get caught up in trying to make things perfect, right? Again, good enough is good enough, right? Just, just make it as excellent as you can. Don't fall into that perfection trap, but just get it to a place where you're like, hey, this is good to go, where maybe you're making little tiny adjustments, tweaks here and there, but it's good. It's it's publishable or, or whatever your, your goal is, and then step away. Let that be good enough. Go work on something else. Go design another game, whatever it is, but it's done. It's finished, and, and it's, it's good. But now what do you want to do? And again, that gets back to the earlier question of what is your goal for the game? Is this something that you were just doing for fun? Is this nice, uh, a nice little thing you can put on your shelf and pull out a Thanksgiving when your family is all around and just have some fun with your friends and something like that? Or is this something you want to actually sh see in a, in a store? You want it to show up in the marketplace. You want it to go to Kickstarter and make a zillion dollars or whatever it is. Because then now what? What are you going to do? And that's when it gets into, okay, how do I get this thing published? And with publishing, there are really two main paths. There's self-publishing and there's licensing out to an established publisher. But let's talk about self-publishing first. And there are really three main paths for self-publishing. And I'll talk about them in order of complexity, order of work involved. The first one is just online as a digital download, maybe you release it as a print and play file, you go out and commission some art or you know some graphic design, you put it into a really nice kind of packaged PDF and then put it out there for free or charge people a dollar or two, whatever you wanna do. You could also put it online on Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, something like that as a kind of online way for people to play it digitally. But that's the first way, the least amount of work involved. Still some work, you're, you're still doing some businessy type things where you're hiring freelancers and, and getting things together. You probably wanna set up an LLC. Again, that's a whole another business thing, a whole nother YouTube video as far as that kind of thing goes. But you know, posting it online, it's a totally, way, totally good way to do it. A lot of game designers do it that way and have success. The second way is using the Game Crafter. They have a really awesome system where you can upload all your files and they will print out physical copies and they kind of have a storefront and you create all the stuff. You put your videos on there, you put some images, things like that. 
and you just sell it through there. And whenever somebody wants to buy it, you just link them to the Game Crafters store and then they purchase it. The Game Crafter uh, prints it on demand. You know, it takes a few weeks to, to get it printed and then they ship it out. So you never have to do anything beyond, again, commissioning art and graphic design and you know creating all the files and uh, the initial setup, but then the Game Crafter takes care of the rest. They also have a really cool crowdfunding system that, that works pretty well. And there, again, there are designers, there are publishers out there that this is all they do. They don't worry about the big Kickstarter campaigns and things like that. They just use the Game Crafter and they make a decent amount of money doing it. You're not going to get super rich off of this. You're probably not going to get rich doing any of this, to be fair. Uh, but it's it's just a really cool way to see your game come to life. So that's another way that I recommend is using the Game Crafter. And then the third way is crowdfunding. Things like Kickstarter, GameFound, Indiegogo, any of those kind of sites where you're basically creating a pre-order campaign for people to say, hey, I want to buy that game, and they give you money, and then they're expecting to receive it, you know, a year or sooner, hopefully, than that, but probably like three years from now, depending on how long it takes for the development process to finish and manufacturing in probably China and whatever you want to do. And there's a lot of work involved. Used to, you could go to Kickstarter and say, hey, I've got an idea, and here's a little bit of artwork, and here's a playthrough video, and you can make $100,000. It's not that way anymore. Crowdfunding is a whole nother world. It's a whole nother skill set of things that you have to learn and figure out if you want to be successful. And there's that's a whole nother video series involved as far as that kind of thing. Uh, again, you're starting a business. You're going to be working with freelancers and, and manufacturers and freight shipping companies. Like there are so many things to do. And I'm just going to be honest, I don't recommend it. And this is coming from a person who has kickstarted and, and game found as well. Now, a bunch of games, a bunch of books, t-shirt campaign. I've done a lot of different stuff on crowdfunding, made a good amount of money. I don't recommend it to people, especially if you're just starting off. The risk is massive. It's, it's, it's huge. And I can't tell you how many companies have made a bunch of money. It looked like, it looked like they made a million dollars and then the game never developed, you know, delivered. And they actually went into debt and they're still trying to recover financially because they lost everything because they didn't manage the money. What like success has ruined a lot of people through crowdfunding. And so be careful with that. I know you see the big numbers, you see the, these big campaigns, you're like, oh, that could be me. And it could, it could be you. It probably won't be. And the odds of you making a pretty terrible mistake with the shipping quotes and all that kind of stuff, it's pretty high. And so I'm going to not recommend it. Knowing that the people that really need to do it aren't going to listen to that advice. <laughs> like I know that. And that. That's totally fine. But if you're just starting out, if you're just trying to figure this, this whole game design, game publishing thing out, be smart. Be careful. Do a small campaign. Do a small you know, $10 game. Do something that's very you know, limited in scope. Don't come in guns blazing with a $200, tons of miniatures, you know, deluxified everything game. It's just, it's just hard. Get your feet wet, figure things out, and then go from there. Start small, build it up over time. So those are the three main paths. So let's talk about pros and cons of self-publishing. The main pro is that you are in full control of the project. You know, if you view this game as your baby, as your child you're trying to bring into the world, then you get to control all aspects of it. You're doing the art direction, you're hiring the people that are gonna be creating the illustrations, doing the graphic design. You're gonna be in control of all of it. And so if that sounds fun to you and it's something I really enjoy, I, I like having I like having the ball, if that makes sense. Like if I'm gonna be, you know, doing all this kind of stuff, I want the ball in my hands and I'm either gonna succeed and, and win or I'm going to fail and lose, but it's going to be on me either way. That's what I'm a huge fan of. So that's why I publish my own games. That's why I do crowdfunding for all, you know, most of them because I, I want the ball in my hands. And if you're like that, then crowdfunding or, or you know, going through GameCraft or whatever, that might be the path to take. That's a huge pro. You also get to keep more of the money. If you're licensing a game to a publisher, you're going to get somewhere between like four and 8% of each copy sold, which is not a lot of money. And if you have a, if you have a $20 game and you're making 4%, it's not much money to speak of. You're going to have to design a ton of games. I think it's like 10 to 12 a year <laughs> if you're going to do this full time, if you're licensing games to publisher. And that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do. And so anyway, those are the main pros. The biggest cons though, the big cons are you have all the risk. Again, kind of what I was talking about with crowdfunding, like you're assuming all the stuff, all the workload, all the marketing, all the figuring out manufacturers and, and quotes and hiring artists. And then that artist 
you know, didn't actually do what you needed them to do, and then they, they left halfway through the project, so now you gotta find another artist to kind of come in and do the other. You're gonna be dealing with all of that. You're gonna be dealing with customer service. And this is one of the things that I just got so frustrated. Now I have a person that handles all my customer service, and Kyle, if you're watching this, really appreciate you, man. You are excellent. Awesome. Uh, but you're gonna have to be answering emails, and I still have to answer a lot of emails and, and Kickstarter messages and things like that. You're gonna be dealing with all the stuff that goes along with the business, right? And you might actually find that you don't have a ton of time for game design because a lot of your time, a lot of your energy, a lot of your mental processes get eaten up by business stuff. And so that's just something to, to think about and just things to be aware of. So let's talk about licensing your game to a publisher. If you don't wanna to have to deal with all the business stuff and all the, the garbage that goes with it and you just wanna design games and get them out there and then design more games and get them out there, approach publishers, see if they'll uh, publish your game, see if they can bring it to life. But just keep in mind, this is probably like a two year process. It's probably gonna take a while to go from approaching a publisher and then eventually signing a contract to your game coming out. Maybe three years, maybe longer. I mean, it just takes a while. The game creation, game manufacturring and shipping all that process, it, it, just, it just takes forever unfortunately, and then the pandemic didn't help anything. And so anyway, just kind of have your eyes wide open with that going in that it's not like, oh, I signed my game and it's gonna show up in show, on store shelf soon. Probably not. It's probably gonna be at least a year, maybe two. Uh, and so let's just talk through the different steps along the way. And I'm just gonna kind of do a brief overview and not dive too deeply into these. This is a whole, it's a whole nother video in and of itself. But the first thing is do your research. Don't just shotgun blast a generic email out to as many publishers as you can think of really take the time and do your research on which publishers does, does your game fit with best, right? Look on your shelf. What games are on your game shelf that you're like, okay, it would fit with them, it fit with them. It kind of falls into this, this line of games. This is a publisher that creates Euro games that take about two hours to play. I've got a Euro game that takes about two hours to play. Hey, that might be a good match. If you have a 30 minute party game, don't approach the publisher that publishes two hour Euro games in, in general, right? That's just doesn't make sense. And then don't send out emails that are like, hey, to whom it may concern, or hey team, hey friend, do some research. Figure out who you're actually contacting. Put in your initial email, your initial message, why you're contacting them. Hey, I love your company. This game right here is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, I'm working on a game, I've designed a game, and I think it falls perfectly into your catalog. It fits in your, your lineup of games for this, this, and this reason. Just be personable, be honest, be open with them about why your game is a good fit for them. Some companies will just take a straight up email. Some companies have a specific contact form you go through. Some companies don't take game submissions like that at all. And so it's something to, to be aware of. Again, you wanna do your research, get online and talk to you know different Facebook communities, things like that. Highly recommend the Board Game Design Lab Facebook communities. The one that it's the one that I run. It's phenomenal, wonderful, encouraging place. But get on there and be like, hey, this is the game I've got. Which company do you think it would be a good fit for? Also, there's Cardboard Edison. They have an amazing list of publishers and what they're looking for and are they taking submissions? And I think they charge like $25 a year or something like that uh, to have access to that list. That is definitely worth your investment if you want to get to get into game designing and get your game published in general but just get online and just figure out as much information, as much data and you know, research as much as you can, and then start sending out emails knowing that you're probably going to be rejected if you even get a response at all. It's pretty typical to not hear back or to not even hear back for months sometimes. It takes a long time to process this stuff. And these, these publishers, even the big publishers in the gaming industry aren't that big as far as like number of employees. Some of them are you know pretty big, 100 plus employees, but most of them it's like, it's like three people, <laughs> if that. A lot of times it's just one person doing everything, and so it might take a little while. And then just see what they say. Maybe they get back to you. They say, oh, that is a really cool idea. And hopefully in your initial message, you sent, you know, what, what's the hook of the game? What, what makes it fun? Why is it interesting? What makes it different? What makes it stand out on the market? Not only why does it fit with this publisher, but why are they gonna make money off of it? And, and so hopefully your initial email gets a response. And hopefully it creates a dialogue where they send you a message back and say, hey, that sounds really cool, tell me more. Or they might ask for what's called a sell 
sheet. And that's a one page document that kind of has all the general information about your game. It's got really cool pictures and you kind of see the visual. You want more images than, than words a lot of times. You don't want just big walls of text. You want like a components list and a few things that make the game stand out. Like what kind of mechanisms is it using? What's the theme? What's the experience? What's your overall gameplay like? Uh, what's the, the player count, the time, all the basic information, they'll probably ask for a sell sheet. And so you want to make one of those. Again, Canva is a really good uh, resource for that. You might consider hiring a graphic designer and paying 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever their hourly rate is, and getting them to design a really good looking sell sheet for you. Because it's like a, this is a job interview, right? You're really going into this process thinking, okay, I am trying to get a job you know, with this company basically where I want to be a designer for them. I want to submit my game to be published. So why not just put your best foot forward, right? Put your best work out there. And so you send them that. And again, there's this dialogue, there's this back and forth where they ask you questions. And then hopefully they'll say, Hey, can you send me a prototype? And that's when you make a nicer prototype and you might consider going through the game crafter or print and play games and having some custom cards, custom dice, whatever it is made, put it all together, send it to them. And then hopefully they play it and then hopefully they really, really like it. And then they say, Hey, here's the contract. And then you go through the terms and then you sign the deal. Maybe not. Right. Again, this is a, it's a long shot and it's hard to get into any industry. It's hard to get published with anything. If you're, you know, if you're writing a book or whatever, it's hard to get into that, but it does happen. Right. And you never know until you, until you ask, right. You, you don't know unless you take the shots. You just got to get out there, take the shot. Now, all along the way, you're probably going to be receiving various forms of feedback where the publisher says, Hey, this isn't for us. And here's why. Maybe it's a little, you know, just a short sentence. Maybe it's a long paragraph. Either way, say, thank you. Say, I really appreciate the feedback. Don't get defensive. Don't get mad and angry and send this you know, upset email. You're, got, you're not going to help anybody in that situation. You're definitely not going to be someone that that publisher is like, Ooh, I really want to work with that person down the road. Don't burn bridges. Just be humble. Take criticism, you know, to the meat, spit out the bones, so to speak but just kind of figure out, okay, how can I take this feedback and then make the game better, make my pitch better, make my sell sheet better, whatever it is, take in that feedback and then improve. Because just like game design is a process that you get better at over time, so is pitching a game. And maybe you get the chance to sit down at a convention and talk to a publisher in person and maybe play the game a few rounds with them, whatever it is, it just takes time. It's a skill set that you have to grow and figure things out. And hopefully it leads to getting the game signed and you actually get to see it show up on a store shelf one day. It's, it's a long shot. It's hard. It's hard to break into any, any industry, right? Whether you're writing a book and trying to get that published or whatever, it's hard, but you never know unless you try. So you got to just take the shot and maybe it'll go in, you, you, but you don't know if you're just holding the ball, right? So you got to take the shot and then see what happens. All right. So that's the general process, the general overview of how to go from idea to published game to get everything out of your head and onto a table. But before we get out of here, I want to give you just some of my best advice overall. And the first one is please realize, just let this be an encouragement. Please realize that you develop taste long before you develop skill. And what that means is you're going to know what's good. Like you can look at something you can play a game and go, Oh, this is really, really good. That happens long before you can actually create something that's good yourself, right? The, the key is just don't quit. Just don't stop. Keep growing, keep working, keep figuring things out, keep getting better. And eventually your taste and your skill will catch up, right? Your, your skill level will catch up to your taste and you can design a game and sit back and go, that's good. That's fun. That's an enjoyable experience. But early on, those two things are going to be pretty far apart, especially if you played a lot of really, really good games. Like if you're a pretty avid gamer, you've played a lot of awesome published games, your, your taste and your skill level, they're going to be gonna be pretty wide and but that's okay right just don't quit don't give up the next thing is don't design in isolation don't try to do this on your own don't try to do it all by yourself uh, it's so much more enjoyable if you have other people around you whether that is maybe working with a co-designer maybe you've got a really good friend that you can sit down and, and chat through ideas and play test together and come up with, with different games together that's a really cool way to do it you have to split the profits you know if you do get the game signed or published or whatever you know, hopefully it's a good friend and it's the journey is the destination in this case. Uh, but there's also lots of really good forums and Facebook communities. The board game design lab group is an awesome place where you can go in and just 
talk shop with other game designers and say, hey, I've got this issue, I've got this problem. Anybody got any ideas? And you can kind of work together, help each other to make great games that people love. And then see if you can find some local playtest groups, some local design groups through through meetups or you know Facebook or whatever, and, and just figure out, can I get in a room with real people that are game designers or gamers and want to play these things and then just enjoy that person-to-person -person contact, that personal interaction. We've had to spend so much time remote for so long that I, I promise just the feeling of being in the same room with people and playing a game, playtesting a game, it is, it's way better. So again, don't design in isolation. The next thing is read as many books and blog posts and listen to many as many podcasts as you can get a hold of. The Board Game Design Lab podcast ran for 300 plus episodes. It's got pretty much every topic you can imagine about game design, but there's lots of other really good pod podcasts out there. Amazing blogs, awesome books on Amazon. Just look up Board Game Design. You'll see lots of really cool things. I'll put several of my favorites down in the description below, but just absorb as much as you possibly can from other people who have done it before, other people who are a little bit further in the process, further in the journey than you are, just gain as much wisdom as you can and then figure out how you can apply it to your own game design process. And then the last thing is have fun. I mean, this is hopefully an enjoyable experience. There's no doubt about it. It's work. It takes a ton of effort and just a ton of work to bring something to life, but it's the best kind of work. I mean, you're creating a fun engine. So find a way to make it fun along the way. Ernest Hemingway talked about writing and he said, writing is nothing. You just sit down at the typewriter and bleed. And game design can definitely feel similar to that sometimes. But at the same time, it's such a collaborative art form where you're working with other people and you're working with so many different parts of your brain to bring the game to life and create the fun. And then you, you find that fun and then you hone it and then you iterate and you do all these different things to, to create moments for other people. And this is honestly my favorite part of the game design process i mean it's such a magical endeavor because what you're doing is you're creating a pathway for other people for people you've never even met before to have an enjoyable experience making memories around a table it, it, it's a special thing so don't take it lightly and i look forward to seeing what you come up with maybe one day your game will hit my table that'd be pretty cool but anyway thanks for watching and i'll see you again soon